to have seen that actually. But that is so indicative of. All right. Oh, got some familiar faces here. Hi, Charles. Hi. Anthony, we heard you. Anthony, are you from Cal? Or Hi there. Cal? Hello. Hi, Vivian. Hi, Josh. Oh my goodness. So so cool to see so many faces wow. I haven't seen in a long time. Oh, Josh, you'll, you you know the guy below you, or I don't know if he's below you on Zoom, but Anthony Doe. It's cool to connect people through through this Zoom. What's up, think, man? Stand I, long time. We were actually roommates, um, second year at, at Berkeley. Me, Josh, San or Anthony, and then Brandon Vu. Cool. 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 Charles, how did you hear of the workshop today? Uh, I'm on Cliff's uh, email newsletter um and have been really enjoying all the programming he's been doing and uh currently i'm in kind of the the bardo state of looking for the next place because we've kind of outgrown this spot um and everything that we look at looks like a project and so <laughs> i saw this and i thought uh this would probably be good to do now rather than get myself in a situation uh that my skills were maybe more than than i thought so i'm really looking forward to your presentation awesome cool. Where, where do you live now? Oh, yeah. What was that? Where do you live? Uh, currently Oakland. Oh, nice. Awesome. Okay. We can talk all about that. Oh, yeah. Connie did a project right right in Oakland in Rockridge. Um, oh, sweet. A little while ago. Um, it's like Charles, two miles I, that way. Oh, really? Um, yeah. you, you know Calvin, right? Is that how we yep. talk? Yep, Calvin Lou, who yeah. just had a baby. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Lily. I haven't met her yet, but um, so cute. The photos. Yeah. yeah. Cool. cool. So we'll, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. I think a lot of you guys have been on before we, the normal routine will start a few minutes after, especially it's right after work, give people a chance to, to tune in. Good chance for us to catch up with folks too. Josh, any, um, yeah. any updates on your end and Viv? Uh, no, no, we are. So we kind of have been, we started the year looking, uh, to buy a home. Um, and then we're like, well, the rates have gone up. Maybe we'll see if the prices will go down. And as you kind of know that it's not really been going down, uh, sort of an interesting market right now. Um, but we're kind of casually looking we, here and there. We'll see something that's, you know, looks kind of promising and, uh, maybe try and offer. And Josh, are you in San Gabriel or around here? here yeah we're in uh we're in pasadena oh awesome oh my sister we just got her into contract in a home in pasadena so nice oh, nice. Hi. oh wow yeah what's up josh long time to see how's it going man it's been a long yeah. time i know good where uh where are you now sam they're right next door to cliff we're roommates actually <laughs> <laughs> No, he's close by. He's in uh in a, the city next over, San yeah, Leandro. Next to Oakland. Oh, nice. San Le you said San Leandro? Yeah. Oh, wow. I Have can't you, live uh, anywhere else without San in it, dude. Yeah. San Gabriel, San Francisco, San Leandro. Uh, so you've been um pretty much a uh, NorCal full time. Oh, hello. Pretty much. Hello. Say hi to Uncle Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hear from everyone and feel free to mention it in the chat um, where everyone's at in their kind of renovation plans or goals. If people are planning to start one soon or hoping to do a renovation or perhaps in the middle of a renovation. If so, this could also be a very great support group for you because sometimes doing a renovation can feel very lonely and uh, very stress inducing as, as many of you may know. Oh, I love it. Trying to find the difference between what I see on HGTV and what I can actually accomplish. <laughs> That's a good one. 
So yeah, maybe um, let me let me kick things off, and then in the meantime, people can kind of type in the chat if you want to respond to Connie's question. Um, but thanks for joining. I know it's a Wednesday; it's after work hours. Appreciate y'all um, making the time. Um, just wanted to introduce Connie. I don't think well, she hasn't been a speaker on on one of these before, but she is a friend. We actually went to high school together. Um, we were debate partners. She is a business partner too. She's also on the Willowmar team with me. She actually, yeah, one of the, the founders and business partner for, for Willowmar. But I thought she would be the perfect person to bring on because um, besides, I guess, a professional fi fi fix and flipper, I don't know someone who has as much experience as her doing significant renovations. She renovated a Victorian duplex in San Francisco, a craftsman style home in Rockridge, um, a single family home in Monrovia in Southern California, and then most recently, a large project down to the studs, a 4,000 square foot um, Monterey Colonial in San Marino. So she either loves home renovation or loves going through the, the pain of home renovation, I guess. And I just thought she would be great to bring on because it's a topic that a lot of people just um, inquired about. You know, home renovation 101, what to look out for. And she is just um, the kindest, um, one of the nicest people that I know, but also I think you'll find that she's one of the wisest too and has just so much to share um, with the group. So without further ado, um, Connie, and, and also I should mention some folks are new to this. We just like to keep this super casual. If you have a question, type it in, chime in. If you want, leave your video on when you're eating. I don't know, just keep it casual. And then um, we'll, we'll be done around uh, six o'clock Pacific. And then we'll, we'll be up. And then I'll also send out the recording to everyone afterwards as well. So, okay. Yeah, without further ado, Connie. Thanks, Cliff. And it's so exciting to be here because yes, I do love renovating. And I think I just love a good project with, with homes or with people. Um, I grew up as one of six kids and I shared a room with three of my sisters. And it wasn't until college that I got my own room and was able to just do with it what I saw fit. And the first thing I did was paint the paint my apartment. And I remember Cliff and I, we both went to Cal. We weren't close friends, but I remember Cliff, you came over and you're like, wow, this is one of the nicest college apartments I've been to. So I take great pride in that. We also had really nice silverware. <laughs> Um, but it was from that college apartment experience ever since then, I've done just about everything from painting to landscaping, to grouting, to retiling, to doing, you know, replumbing, hiring contractors, firing contractors, taking a home down to the studs. Um, not all directly myself, but learning who to hire the, you know, I have done some things on my own, but really le learning to bring in the professional and when to do it. Um, most of my projects have been from a personal standpoint with the idea of adding value, but to really personally enjoy and, and with an investment kind of framework. So that's what I'll be sharing mainly today. But of course, we'll share a little bit about even if you're going to what it's like to renovate for resale. And have, as Cliff mentioned, this is very casual. Please share all, all of our questions and we hope to answer them. Um, and I will say um, with that approach, kind of we'll dig into some of the homes as case studies and what I've done and kind of what I've learned from them in the process. And I, I will even share some numbers too, just to give you a frame of reference of what to expect, especially because us, some of you have shared kind of living in the Bay, some in LA, you know, we're talking about high price points to begin with in just owning your home. So the next step is, okay, well, how am I going to even put money into this home? Is it worth it? You know, how much do things cost and kind of go from there? So uh, the first home I'll talk about is our Alamo Square remodel. We bought a duplex um, in Alamo Square for a million nine hundred fifty, so just um, under two mil, and we. Um, we bought a duplex because our, we were able to account for the rental income of the second unit to rent it out and have that income to have really help offset our mortgage. My husband and I, we put about 100K in kind of some 
minimal projects and they they happen kind of in piecemeal form as our needs changed. Um, this is the home that we eventually had our first child in. So um, we knocked uh, out, I think, I'm trying to think, we knocked out a closet to make room for a nursery. So um, kind of to give you a lay of the land, this was the kitchen that we bought. And whenever I see a kitchen like this on the left side, I love it because you've got the bones there. And I think this is a huge important piece is First, when you're looking at a space, does the layout and light work for you? Because if that, you know, if you have some of those kind of foundational points, then you can really just do the cosmetic stuff. And that's what we did here, which is we changed out the flooring to kind of just match the rest of the home. Um, we put in new countertops, painted the cabinetry. So it's all the same cabinetry. And we changed out the hardware and the lighting fixture um, and put in an undermount sink. That's kind of just, I would say that's what's known as a cosmetic update because we're not really getting into major plumbing. We did um, connect, uh, we did change out our faucet, but otherwise the, you know, the plumbing line is still there. So this is almost the ideal situation when you are looking to do a renovation is when you don't really have to change many of the major systems. It's really the cosmetic stuff and that's the least invasive. So changing out um, appliances, super easy, relatively cost-effective, but I would say the biggest two things of kind of that will make the biggest impact I've seen in all of our renovations has been paint and lighting. If you just have minimal means and can give your place a fresh coat of paint and change out the light fixture, that already will give it an, a huge uplift um, and a modern feel. Um, and then with our Rockridge- on, One quick yeah. question on, on the um, duplex. Um, the cabinets, so it looks like you kept them all in place, but just refinished them. Is that what you did here? Yep, we just- um, painted them. So I think typically with wood cabinetry, it is ideal to do some sanding first just to smooth out any of the edges and any good painter will know um, how to how to go about painting cabinets. But it's yeah, that's all we did. And and it instantly felt um, fresh and new. Yeah, wow, like remarkable how I, I don't I, I hope I'm, I'm I'm I think I'm speaking for the group, but it's like that photo on the right. I mean, that one really pops. And to, yeah, to, to know that it was just more all cosmetic to change that from the left to the right is, wow, looks, looks quite different. And Steph asked, did I do this um, DIY it myself or did we hire someone? So we hired a painter. I'm, I having painted uh, before actually this Alamo Square home, we owned a condo and my husband and I painted all of that. And that made me appreciate painters so much because it was, even though it was a small one bedroom condo, the amount of prep work that goes into painting is almost, I would say like three times harder than the actual painting itself, but it's so crucial because you have to tape all the proper edges. Sometimes you have to sand, for example, with cabinetry, it's ideal to sand. Um, you Sometimes you have to remove the cabinetry, which actually in here, they actually had to remove all the fronts um, to, properly spray, uh, they sprayed the, these cabinets. Um, so a lot of prep work goes into painting and highly recommend hiring good painters, unless you love a good project and want to DIY, which we know some folks who've done it and um, I've dabbled in a little bit and I no longer will want to paint my own stuff. But yeah, and hardware, I would say that was, um, there's something about kind of the jewelry of a home, which is kind of in the hardware and sort of the fixtures. That's sort of another layer that really adds texture and kind of um, uniqueness to your home that gives it, I would almost say you can splurge there and kind of go, like here we went cheaper, we just kind of painted our cabinetry and then we splurge a little on some really nice hardware at a local hardware store in Noe Valley. Um, in our Rockridge remodel, so for this home, the backyard was the big selling point. And for our East Bay folks, um, the sunshine and the warmth you get is what, you know, prompts you to move to, to the East Bay. And so here we really wanted to 
put money into our backyard. So for this remodel, this backyard actually cost us about 75,000. Um, there's a big deck, which you don't see, that's kind of from the vantage point um, of the photo. And um, a big cost in this was actually the fencing. We did all new fencing because it was pretty uh, dilapidated. And um, it, once, it, with the thing with fencing and landscaping is if you just landscape, but then you have older fence, it becomes very noticeable, which we knew. So we just knew we just had to start and go kind of almost all new fencing to all around. Um, and here we did AstroTurf. I'm a big fan of that. But we bought this home for, um, and to go back, so we've always but with the intention it, we would live there long term, but actually in our San Francisco home, we only lived here for two years. We bought it for, as I shared, just under two million and we sold it for two and a half million in part because of our remodels. Also, you know, just the market and real estate, it's when you hold something, um, particularly something that um, is in a prime location, it is it has some updates, um, it, the value um tends to appreciate, which um, has been, we've been really fortunate. And we see that time and time again, especially in our line of work. Um, in this Rockridge home, we also, I, um, when we bought it, the sellers shared that they raised six kids in here and being one of six kids, I was like, we're gonna raise all of our kids here. Um, and um, we ended up just living here for two years, but um, ended up selling it for 2.6 million after putting it about 100K in, mainly in the backyard. Um, and, um, this one was fun because we worked with the landscaper that I work, we've used in the past. He did our San Francisco home. Um, but he was a big talker. And I think you'll find with some contractors, they're so great at some things and then other things, they're really challenging. So, um, really establishing clear boundaries with your contractor is important. So this one, for example, he would just talk on and on, um, that I'd have to end our meetings promptly. Otherwise, it was hard to get any work done. Um, and also a lot of times he wouldn't show up and know that that's very common for a lot of contractors. How they work is they will secure your job. And in order to kind of secure the next job, they will, they will kind of start on yours and then start on the next one in order to just get in the door. Um, know that that's quite common. It is really important to just be on top of the communication with your contractor um, and have a clear kind of guideline in terms of when they expect to start and finish and um, ensuring that they're very responsive in finishing out the project. At the, this one became quite the ordeal where I'd, I'd literally have to text him almost every day and like, who's showing up today? Who's showing up? Um, and it is how, how long did this one take? This took, I want to say, um, I think two and a half months. Yeah. Feels, feels like a long time, even though when I say two and a half months, it doesn't, that doesn't feel that long, but I, I want to say about two and a half months. Yeah. Um, the next uh, case study I'll share is this home that I'm in right now is our San Marino home. So this originally started with, we were just going to change the, um, the kitchen and the bathrooms and call it a day. And you'll find this is common. You may begin something and then you're like, oh, but if we're going to do this, we might as well do this. And it can really spiral. So one big tip I've heard is it's helpful to have your grand master plan as they call it so that you really account for everything. Although sometimes if you do that, you may not even start at all because it can be so much. Um, but this really led from just wanting to do our kitchen and baths to kind of just taking everything down to the studs and kind of starting anew, um, which uh, was a blessing and a curse in many ways. We hired our contractor from, for this one because I was pretty new to the area, didn't really have contacts quite yet. Found our contractor on Yelp. He, you know, met with, with him. He had great energy, super approachable. And how I hire people is thinking, how are they going to respond if I have to tell them some bad news or if I have to have a hard conversation with them? Am I going to feel comfortable? Because in construction, there will be a lot of tough conversations. And he just seemed very approachable, which I liked. Um, 
the flip side to that was this was his biggest project to date and he didn't know a number of things that really hurt our project and set us back. For example, in the city of San Marino, it's almost like a mini HOA. It's very uh, akin to also building in San Francisco where the permitting is really tough. They're very stringent on a lot of things. In the city of San Marino and um, on top of California, where if you renovate more than 40% of the space by permitting, you need fire sprinklers. Um, but San Marino, in addition to that, you need a fire alarm system, which we did not know. And so we had to stop plans because an inspector came and was, he was like, oh, you don't have any of this. You need to resubmit your plans um, for the fire sprinklers and for your fire alarm um, before you can continue any additional work. So that set us back, gosh, um, probably a month or so, which in the big scheme of things for a 4,000 square foot down to the studs remodel, this took us a whole year. That's actually pretty fast for a big uh, a remodel of this size, but but it was very long and painful for us with two kids and just firing a contractor was not fun. And But it was good practice to just do it. And we did it very amicably. We just said, you know, this is not going to work. And we then had to really work out the numbers of how much was owed. And that accounting for um, kind of how much you owe a contractor can be really tricky because for big projects, they take payments in either percentages or by what they accomplish. Um, and so if you are doing a big project, it's really important that you have your own accounting system and that could be a simple spreadsheet because they'll have their own. And, and as I mentioned earlier, some contractors, I would say the paperwork and the administrative parts are not always their expertise. So it's really good you have your own set of records. Uh, Steph asked a really good question. How do you find your contractors to work with and how do you determine which one you want to hire? So uh, great question. I, for a new place, I do a lot of basic Yelp and asking people in the neighborhood for recommendations. Um, this one, because we thought it was a smaller project, I was like, okay, Yelp is sufficient for what I'm looking to do. I have a good design sense. I think I can navigate that on my own. Um, but I would really say um, oftentimes your local realtor will have really good contacts. For example, in the Bay, we have all of our good go-to people for our listings prep whenever we're getting a listing ready for the market, we have our go-to contractor, go-to painter, go-to handy person, our go-to landscaper. And these are people we've worked with time and time again. So we know that whatever they quote us is reasonable because we know their pricing. Um, and we've also just been in the business of getting multiple bids so we can compare and know um, what feels reasonable and what doesn't. But we also know that they're going to finish on time because um, that's a big thing of these contractors, as I mentioned, some start and then they will take on a new project and then they won't finish yours. So with this contractor that we ended up hiring a second time, he came to us through our designer. So I love design and that's what got me into wanting to take on projects. But having to design for a 4,000 square foot home, there are all these little things that I didn't even think about and they just became heavy decisions that I did no longer had the energy and space for. I also just had a, a second child. So that was already exhausting on top of managing a business. So we decided to hire a designer to help project manage and kind of hold our design ideas and make sure everything was cohesive. Um, but really it was to project manage our contractor. Um, and the designer we ended up hiring came through a colleague of mine out here in um, San Marino. And she was so great and she connected us with her designer. So Vivian asked a really great question. Did you hire a designer first before you work with the contractor? In this case, we kind of, we almost did that because we ended up hiring our designer and then she introduced us to our new contractor. Um, um, but for our, our a previous project we did that I didn't share as a case study, that contractor actually ended up designing some kind of basic preliminary sketches that we had, and then I kind of chose all the finishes. So there are some contractors that have sort of their design build team where they help you design. Um, and then there are others that will work with a designer or you can choose a designer or you can design on your own as well. Um, really depends how you how much you want to be involved. I would say designers at first, because I love design, I was like, I can't, I don't want to, you know, spend the money in hiring a designer. But ours helped us so much and so worth 
worthwhile in her costs and actually her costs were very reasonable. Um, but for example, when we brought her on to the project to just get a sense of, you know, would it be a good working relationship? She already gave ideas that I hadn't considered. Like for example, one room, we were trying to figure out how to create windows and to maximize the light between the two rooms, but she actually proposed closing off the, the, the whole wall, which was something I never thought of. And that proved to be so invaluable where now we can have two official rooms with privacy, especially with working from home and kind of just having needing more designated spaces in today's sort of working and living situation. Um, so I do, for those who may be hesitant on hiring a designer, I do think they provide a, provide a lot of value and really can help hold the vision together and will share things that you may not have considered or thought about in the past. Um, so people ask like, why renovate? I think a lot of you here have your own motivations for renovating um, and um, and might even be in the process or begin to think about planning for one. But I, the reason why we have this conversation in the first place is because, as some of you mentioned, there are just so many more older homes out in the market. And especially in this tough market where housing prices are so high, it almost makes more sense to get an older home so you can hopefully get it at a lower cost to renovate and then for you to add value. And the reason why I wanted to share kind of the price points I did before was because a lot of the homes, I mean, we only lived in those homes for two years, max, uh, the Rockridge, Oakland home and the San Francisco home. And yes, appreciation in real estate attributed to that, but really it was the renovations that helped sell and bring in the right buyers and who saw the value in the home. Um, and that's where you can add sort of your equity and value to the home. Um, and also I will say our team works with a lot of home buyers and a lot of first time home buyers, especially don't want to renovate because it it's stressful. There's a lot of money at stake. Um, a lot is out of your control. It can be a nuisance. It's dusty and dirty and noisy. And so a lot of that will hold people back from renovating. But if you're able to see it in an approachable way, and that's our goal, is there's so much more value to be added to your home and um, not only for your own personal enjoyment, but for future resale. Um, plus, a lot of times people will factor in the cost to renovate much higher than it, what it actually costs to renovate a home. Um, so that's where if you're savvy, you can really win in that sense. Cliff, do you have anything to add to that point? No, I, th I think it's just a really, I, I like what you said there, because um, yeah, I think that's probably top of mind for a lot of people here, which is um, like, how do I get into a home? And I think you've, pro you've proven kind of time and time again that like folks can buy a home at a lower cost, hopefully, if there needs to be some work done, and then you can add value too. But I, I know we've talked about kind of a lot of like the real estate agent side of things, but one thing I'll share too is like, when you've lived in a home and then sell it after you've done the renovations, I think the new buyer, uh, perceives that as kind of more valuable than like if if you were to fix and flip it because I think then people go oh has anyone lived in it before but if you've lived in it and kind of tested the the pudding so to speak then that's that's helpful too when when you do decide to sell the home yeah and you get to enjoy it I would say I mean those the homes we renovated we've gotten to personally enjoy and that is so satisfying because also um, a lot of the finishes we chose were a lot nicer because we had the intention of staying there much longer um, but it you know it, it's it's good because you don't lose out on that value of the money you put in um, when you go to sell and funny enough that brings up a great story uh, we have clients that we just helped close the home in Glendora, which for some people who may not know, it's maybe about 45 minutes from LA. Um, it's, um, and they were expecting um, a baby. Um, the wife was uh, six months pregnant at the time of their search. So we had kind of like, all right, we need to find them a home. And they were like, we want move in ready, move in ready. And we came across this one home that really was kind of a cosmetic fixer that the sellers had lived there for 30 years and they meticulously took care of everything. They would get their water heater checked up. Um, we saw their inspection reports. Everything was so clean that we knew the bones were really good. And I articulated to the cl our clients, this is a home where you kind of just want 
you want to take it on because the renovations are going to be on the lighter end, but they were still stubborn. And they're like, no, Connie, we, we don't want to do anything. Um, fast forward, they saw maybe a handful more of more homes and, and they, they were getting up bid on some of the ones that were move-in ready that funny enough, they came back to this one. And luckily it was still available. Um, we built a relationship with the listing agent and we ended up getting the home for them. And they just are about to finish their renovations. Um, this week, they sent us some photos and it, it, it looks uh, like a brand new home. It's pretty incredible. And really what they did was just, they changed out the flooring, they painted, um, and they went really fun with some of the rooms. They like painted their nursery two tones of green. Um, they painted their kitchen cabinetry and retiled their bathrooms. But for the most part, I would say that's a lighter renovation and, and their home looks so new. So um, I would say for those who may be on the fence to, to just keep an open mind with it. Um, okay, some things to think about when uh, renovating. So let's get into it of what to expect. Um, renovations are tough. They're exciting, but they're tough. And I think that's why um, people are hesitant to approach them. Um, and as kind of I mentioned earlier, they're just very stressful. And I think a big part of what's stressful about them is, yes, a lot's at stake. It's your money, your time, you know, the, the, the money is probably the biggest thing at stake, but a lot of things are out of your control. And those are things like your contractor not showing up or finding something um, that you did not anticipate or plan for and know that that is common. So even if you have, you know, you buy your home, you've got, you've done your inspections, it's not uncommon that once you open up a wall, you're going to find something that the inspector didn't even find because they can't see past the walls in many cases. Um, and that's normal, but it really is how you go about handling that um, and know that there will be some surprises in our San Marino home. Actually here where I'm standing, there used to be a wall here. When they demoed it, they found a two by four, which is like a very small piece of wood brick, essentially kind of holding up like some of the framing and like that, we, no one would have never known until you knocked down a wall. We also found some moldy pipes um, from kind of just a past leak and, you know, none of that's fun, but, but very common and you just kind of learn to embrace it. And I will say, if you can learn how to deal with stress, you will be good in um, going through a renovation. Um, so with that, it is good to budget about 10% over um, what you, uh, you know, what your contractor has quoted because there will be these surprises you might have to account for. And also sometimes there's what's called a change order. And that's um, when you're, uh, you know, you want to go with a different type of material versus the one you had previously selected and that's what they quoted you on. Or say they have to repair something, they're gonna add what's called a change order, meaning, you know, just another new line item accounting for that cost. Um, when hiring, and this kind of will go to your question, uh, Steph, to answer more. When hiring, I will say referrals are key because then you have someone you know that can vouch for them and can really tell you what it's like. With the contractor that ended up finishing our project, he just finished um, one of my clients home in um, St. Gabriel, and then he's about to start an ADU for other clients in Alhambra, and he just gave two bids for clients this past week. So it's referrals go a long way and people really, you know, it's natural to trust someone that you trust um, and that, you know, has worked on a project um, that you've seen or are aware of. Um, I will say kind of some good questions to, or actually some something to think about when you're hiring a contractor is there's the saying you've got fast, cheap and quality. No matter what kind of project you're doing, you can only have two out of the three. So for our first contractor, I think we were trying to go fast and cheap and that did not work out for us um, and ended up the second contractor. I would say he was fast in quality. So he he was definitely not on the cheaper end. He I wouldn't say he was on the expensive end, but um, just know that this 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 rule applies and I've seen it time and time again. It's it really does speak for itself. Um, Ani, uh, question for you. What, what have you kind of seen on the timeline side? So for mm -hmm. example, the contractor says, hey, this is going to take six months. 
what do you mentally budget in your head? Or does it really depend on the contract? Are some contractors really, when they say six months, it takes six months, or is it always similar to what you said for budgeting 10%? Should you always just budget some extra time as well? Or how do you think about that? I would, I would always budget some extra time just in case, because sometimes there are surprises. I think how much you budget really depends on the scope of work you're doing, because then you can know what other surprises can happen. Um, if you're doing, for example, just a bathroom, I might give it an extra week or two um, on the safe side, because you may want to bring in a cleaner or you may want to repaint if you haven't accounted for that. But I would say it's definitely good to at least give yourself a two two week buffer um, for kind of maybe a smaller project. I would say when you're doing a pretty big major renovation, give yourself about a month extra just to be safe. And in your head, actually, by default, I would just plan like it's going to run over time so that if the contractor, but don't let your contractor know that. But, you know, just keep on your contractor and let them know you are holding accountable to the time, but just know that there likely will be a delay. Um, surprisingly, with our Monrovia home, which I didn't share, that contractor actually finished on time. And that and, and what we did there was we renovated all new flooring, all new paint, our bathrooms, and we opened up a wall. And he he was really great, I will say, in terms of delivering on his timelines. And that's probably on the more rare side. Yeah, because I think one thing that I'm hearing from you, which is really nice, is like part of the home renovation process is like managing, I guess, your own expectations and your own level of stress. Um, because if you do manage that well, then there is kind of what is fruits of your labor at the end of the process, right? In terms of adding value and hopefully, you know, your home sells down the road for a higher price and you get to enjoy it. But managing that stress and expectations on your own is important. So then you don't have too many gray hairs, lose too much sleep. And just know that a lot of these things are um, expected. Dealing with contractors can be tough. That brings me to my next point. This I heard this somewhere. It's naive enough to start, stubborn enough to finish. And I, when I heard this, I was like, yep, that is me. Because, yeah, we went in, I would say, um, yes, we had a good handle having done renovations to lead us up to this big one, but I was still so naive. There were so many things I didn't know and know for you, there will be a lot of things you may not know and you'll learn in the process, but that just makes you a much more informed homeowner, which is really great, um, uh, great skill to have. And also just um, for the future homes, because it's not uncommon, especially today's age to own multiple homes, um, but you want to be stubborn enough to finish. And that involves you know, really hounding on your contractor or just, you know, having sight of the finish line and being able to manage your own stress and, you know, keep, keep sight of the big picture. Um, because it is sometimes if you know too much, if you really know how daunting it is, you don't want to start. Um, so sometimes you, it helps to be a little naive. And I know I've learned so much in this renovation and it was very much a test of my own character and resilience. Um, and definitely got a lot of gray hairs from the process. Um, and there's actually, there's a saying too that, you know, some renovations and marriages. And I, I am not surprised by that because it's, you're just in such high stress environments. You can't take out your anger on um, certain people. So you can, you know, it's easily, you're able, easily able to do it to your partner. You know, they're the closest to you, or sometimes you both have dis different decision-making processes or different ways of dealing with stress that it makes sense that, you know, it really shows your, sometimes your, your, your true colors or your ugly side. And, um, and it's, it can be really tough. So having a really good partner, knowing kind of the expectations of, it will be stressful. Okay, how are you guys going to manage that? Um, really ha scheduling in fun time to celebrate the wins is important. Um, oh, Wendy has a question. Did you have to move out of any of the homes you had to renovate? If you haven't, how would you need to, um, to move out? How would that affect your decision to renovate? Oh, that's a really great question. So in some of the homes, we lived through it. For example, in our San Francisco home, that first photo I showed you of the kitchen, we lived through that remodel. And while it wasn't, um, uh, I will say for, you know, in my own terms, the major renovation, although it can be a major in many ways at that time, it wasn't a major renovation to us. Um, 
it was not fun, but we made it work because we were just, you know, yeah, we didn't have another place to live in. It's, you know, it's hard to account for multiple places to live in and pay for rent and for your mortgage. Um, I will say it's always ideal if you don't have to live through a renovation because, um, because that can certainly add to the stress. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it can be a nuisance. It's a lot of dust. It's a lot of noise and construction. Um, but of course not, you know, if you don't have the choice, you, there's, there are ways to make it work. Um, and sometimes, yeah, that can very much affect kind of your decision to renovate. And maybe it might be that you renovate piecemeal because if you're living in this space, maybe it's that you're living in the home and you renovate one bathroom at a time. And that works, you know, if that works for you, you really just wanna do what works for your budget, what works for your lifestyle um, and what works for your kind of daily um, way about what you envision your renovations to look like. Um, this one question I get a, a quite a bit, and, and Cliff, I'm sure you, yeah, this is common. Uh, where am I going to get the most return on my investment? So like for people who, you know, want to do some re renovations or it's like, okay, hey, I want to do this. Is it worthwhile? Am I going to see that money back? I will say the biggest places to renovate and where we see the highest return is because this is where buyers are constantly looking for what's renovated is the kitchen and the bathrooms those are kind of the highest points because those are the most used rooms. Um, and so kitchen and baths are, you will always you know, see your return on investment. I will say a few other tips to keep in mind. You don't wanna go too trendy on fixtures and finishes. Um, you know, you may wanna go trendy on furniture cause that's, you know, a lower cost, but keep in mind trends will, will eventually turn and and then when you go to sell it may look very outdated so if you're going to go for things on trend I would try to mix it or go with um more timeless pieces or or sometimes just mixing it up where you can have some things that are on trend or trendy versus some timeless pieces so that it doesn't feel like it's all one type of style where it will scream an era when you go to sell um and then um another can I add one thing, Tom? Yeah. Um, I, I don't. I think everyone here is tuned in mostly to for their own personal home renovation. Yeah. Folks who are curious about like if you're going to fix and flip a home, for example, high ROI. In addition to what Connie said, kitchen and bath, um, paint. I know that's kind of a no-brainer. That goes a really long way. Light fixtures and also just hardware, um, like on the doors and also like the kitchen cabinets and those things. In terms of just ROI, I mean, like a light fixture is literally 20 to $50 at Home Depot. That can make a room look significantly different and paint as well, pretty low cost and pretty high ROI. So I, I would add those two, but that's more for a fix and flip situation. Yeah. And that's, those are the lowest costs that will yield you the highest return, paint and light fixtures, paint and lighting. Um, and that's, even if you're in your home now and you're like, oh, I will, you know, I ideally want to renovate one day, but I don't, you know, have the time, energy, or money, try changing out a light fixture or, um, you know, painting, painting your walls and, and that will dramatically change it and will give it a new, uh, fresh feel. Um, let's see questions I should ask a contractor. This kind of goes back to, um, what I think, uh, Vivian asked before, um, what kind of questions to ask. So it is good to know how your contractor communicates and how you communicate. And if those are on par with each other, um, because as I mentioned, some contractors administration is not gonna be their strong point. So emails, they may not be very good at emails but maybe they're just good at having weekly face-to-face -face meetings. Um, I would ask like, you know, what issues do, do they foresee in your home just so that you can account for any of potential surprises and at least they're setting the expectations that are clear with, with you. Um, and then how do they deal with kind of surprises or, you know, how do they issue their change orders? Um, what do they expect for costs if X were to happen? You kind of want to plan as much as you can for worst case scenarios just to help set everyone's expectations. Um, it's good to know if they've completed your type of project before. Um, for example, our first contractor, this remodel that we did, it was just He'd never done a project this size, and I think I gave too much benefit of the doubt. Um, in our in your city, I wouldn't say this is so important if your city is pretty lax on permitting. Um, Oakland, for example, I think Oakland is pretty lax in some cases. San Francisco, on the other end, definitely 
much more strict. San Marino, definitely much more strict. So I think it helps to have a city, a, a contractor who's worked in your city um, if if it's a lot more stringent in the permitting process. Um, and then it's good to ask for references if you can, especially depending on the type of project you're looking to do. Um, it's good, most are familiar with that process and they're happy to share some contacts or even walk you through a property site that they've done that might be nearby or um, show, share some photos with you. Or you can look them up on House, H-O-U-Z-Z or, or Yelp too. Or, or your friends and colleagues, or us, we've we are happy to share our good go-to folks too. One one thing um, that I'll add too is, um, and it's not necessarily a, a question, but it's just more of a comment. Just I think when it comes to contractors, general contractors, think of it more as a relationship as well. Um, I think that's I think a lot of people go, oh, I'm just going to do this one remodel and I'll be done with it. But if you kind of step back and think about it, your house, you might not be fixing the roof, for example, but a good general contractor in five years, 10 years, when you have a roof problem and you built that relationship with them should have a good subcontractor to help with roofs. Or maybe you're not touching the electrical in this case, but they should have a good electrical subcontractor as well. So um, I just think, yeah, in general, you know, taking the, the long view, the long-term view on yeah. things and, and really thinking about this is a relationship ideally um, someone that you want to work with for a long time can, can really help you. And if you do another project in that city, um, and if you want to go down the investment route and you're thinking about doing a flip project down the road, having that person that you can contact and you can trust will, will be a lot more important than trying to make this a one-time. Uh, yeah. you, you bring up such a great point too, Cliff, because there will also be problems that might pop up after they finish the renovation that you want to have a good relationship with them to come back and make those fixes too. Because um, for example, with this home here, we've had a number of things pop up, which is not uncommon. And we've built such a great relationship with our contractor that he, um, he will fix things as they pop up that relate to what you know, his team was responsible for. We've had some other issues on our own end that we brought him in to just, hey, can you, we want to do this too. Can you do this? Um, and so know that yeah, having a contractor is a very long-term relationship. And if it's a good one, you will probably be referring them to all of your friends and, and family members too, because sometimes the hard ones, the good ones are hard to come by. One big tip, and we're just about to wrap up before Q&A, is um, one thing that's super crucial is anytime you're doing a big renovation where it's going to be kind of loud or louder than usual, is to introduce yourself to neighbors. I think this one is highly overlooked, and it's a small little tidbit that if you don't know your neighbors already, it's a good way to just knock on their door and introduce yourself. So many of them, you'll be surprised, will really just appreciate that gesture. But the big point of this is if anything were to go wrong or they're annoyed or mad or anything, you want them to contact you first before they contact the city. Um, and we did that for our Monrovia remodel. It was nerve wracking at first to just even knock on the doors, but that did wonders. And we actually made some friends out of the, just introducing ourselves to neighbors. Here, same thing, because San Marino is so strict, we introduced ourselves to our neighbors to the sides of us. We brought, dropped off a plant um, and just you know, said, if you have any issues, please, please call, call us, here's our number. And, um, and it's just a nice way to meet your neighbors. We've since like collected their mail for them. And I think it just brings it back to reminding ourselves and others that we're all, all human too. Um, and um, yeah. Last thing. Okay, so you you want to buy a house to renovate. Some of you are in that bucket. Where do I start? And this is just kind of big picture. You really want to know what are your goals? Is it to live in the home long term? Is this going to be the house you just live in for three years? I will say for first time homes, the average turnover is seven years. So know that it may not be your forever home. Or if you want it, you know, put it, renovate it to Airbnb or for a long term investment. It really depends on what your goals are. That's, I would say, kind of answer that question first when you're thinking about where to start um, and then really seek your local realtor because they will have sort of the the toolkit of all the the go-to people that they've tried and used many times or um, can really vouch for and for us I can say we've we've had our fair share of really great folks and also some not so great folks too um, and really they can then help you with the ins and outs of navigating the market, knowing especially for some of these homes that need renovation, they may not be formally on the market, but your local realtor may know of them. Um, and sometimes those are the great buys because you're not competing with other folks. 
Um, but yeah, just having a clear roadmap and knowing that it's very attainable. So I hope um, you, I hope you find this helpful and that it's approachable. I think that's the biggest thing we, Cliff and I want to get across. So here's our contact. You have mine, um, as you probably already have Cliff's. Um, you can follow along. My Instagram's at cconron, and I have posted some fun renovation stories on there too. But yeah, we'll open it up for more Q and A. And you guys have had such great questions in, throughout the process. And yes, Charles, plants do go a long way. Plants are also a great way to add life and and kind of spruce up your space. So we talked about renovation. I could, you know, we can have a whole other conversation on design, but plants are such a great way to add life to your space and very affordable too. Trader Joe's has really great plants for really great pricing. Ooh, Wendy asked, when do you need to hire an architect versus a designer? That's a great question. Typically, you would want an architect when you're doing anything structural. So say if you wanted to move some walls um, or if you were even going to do, um, yeah, I would say an architect is when walls, walls and structures are involved because um, they're able to really create sort of those uh, kind of plant schematic designs and plans. A designer can very much do those same things too, but an architect really is about kind of mapping out layout, space planning, um, really uh, counting. They sort of work with um, the, sometimes you'll need a structural engineer if you are moving some walls or doing kind of up to a certain amount of renovations, a structural engineer. Um, for example, um, we remove this wall right here that actually required us to bring in a structural engineer to account for um, to account for making sure that our our home could support the load um, and that we had the proper footing um, and kind of headers and reinforcements. Um, so know that the your contractor will likely for something like a structural engineer. I I didn't know who to hire, and that's very common to not know. Likely your GC will have their go to point of contact when it comes to structural engineer, and usually. For them, it's like they come in and out and they kind of create their plans. It's a very um, streamlined process on how they work. It's like, in, it's almost an in and out situation of them coming in, assessing, and then drawing things up and submitting it. Um, but for an architect, I would say architect is sort of the bones and behind the scenes. A designer sort of a lot of times what you see up front, but sometimes they work, they very much work hand in hand. And we have some clients who actually are, own architect design firms. Um, I'll give two shout outs to them. We've got GTL Architects um, and also Homework Design, both are clients and lovely. They're both design architect, husband and wife duos. Re uh, related to that, Con, um, how much, uh, like how much does a designer cost? And is that, do you pay them hourly or yeah. how do you, like, I guess your engagement with the designer in, in SoCal, how did, how did that work out? They, they have different kinds of pricing. So a lot of times it depends on what the scope of work is. So for this, I can share with this home, we hired her specifically to project manage and actually to design a few rooms, which included um, kind of layout of the space in terms of furniture and finishes. So um, for certain rooms, she charged an a la carte price. I think it was um, a couple grand, maybe two to three grand. Um, and that included sourcing kind of what pieces of furniture um, they would come with the space design. Um, and then I think her, um, her project management was a la carte hourly. Um, and I think it, it that you can expect because we did interview a couple um, project managers and it ranged from about 100 an hour to, I want to say 125 seemed to be around the cost here at least. Okay, let's see. Yeah, when, Wendy had a question. Maybe I'll, I'll read it for the group. So she said, we've looked into renovating an 1800 square foot single family home in SF, our personal home. We've received some ballpark estimates from various architects that seem really high, close to 1 million to, for adding a 400 square feet and limited renovations on the existing house. 
We'd also likely have to move out during the renovations. Any sense of how much renovation should cost per square foot in San Francisco? Ooh, okay, that's such a great question, Wendy, and exciting to think about. And also, I imagine nerve wracking given a lot is at stake. Um, so, when you are adding square footage, that's when you're what's called you're going beyond the envelope of the home. Um, and that definitely is at a higher cost um, because you are then, but anytime you build outside of the envelope of your home, um, especially in a city like uh, San Francisco, you do have to go through the permitting process. And that can be, that is certainly more costly because you're counting for permits, you're counting for time. Um, a lot of architects, designers will price out for that 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 time and going to the city, the revisions, the, the, the permitting, all of that adds up. Um, and so I will say kind of a rough um, dollar per square foot, I would say in San Francisco, probably five to $600 a square foot. Um, and th that can very much fluctuate based off the finishes because finishes, you could go for a slab that might be, um, you know, $20 a square foot or $100 a square foot. So really, um, that the finishes range, but I would say kind of renovations, five to 600 a square foot, sometimes 700 a square foot, depending on what neighborhood you are in the city too. Um, Cliff, you want to share more on that? Anything? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's kind of spot on. It's hard to give kind of a rough estimate because it really, there's so many factors like, are you pouring a new foundation? Are you going beyond the envelope of the home, as you mentioned? But I think that's kind of a, in line. We had um, Cottage ADU, um, come present and they mentioned for at least building an ADU, which I guess is adding to the envelope of the home, kind of separate new build. Um, they said it ranged, I think between 200 to 500 per square foot, but that's 200 is like very bare bones, kind of just converting a garage effectively 500 higher end ADU. So that's, that's in mind with what, with what we, what I've heard too. Yeah. And Wendy, if you need additional contacts, we're happy to share our, our go-to folks in the city too. We're really great. Any other questions? I know we're coming up on our hour. And also, yeah, if you have questions that you want to chat privately, feel free to send me an email. Happy to share more. Well, great to hear stuff. Any opinions on design build versus um, design a bid build? Ooh, oh, I like that question. So I think I like both, and we've worked with both design build and also design uh, kind of, just for those who may not know, there are firms that are called design build firms where they do the design for you and they build the home. And sometimes it's nice because everything is in-house. You're only dealing with one, um, you know, party, so to speak. Um, but then also there are some really great, um, say you have a specific designer you really want to work with. It's, they will likely have their builder or contractor that they highly recommend and have worked with in the past. Um, that is also a great route. So I think it really depends on what type of style you're going for. If you really like the style of some of the, these design build firms, um, sometimes I will say their, their finishes tend to be less customized, but if that's, you know, if you like some of their aesthetics or projects that they've done, maybe you, you can try to um, really uh, specify it yourself. Or if you have a designer you really like to work with, that may be the better route to go. So both are really great for different reasons. Well, thank you all for coming. Want to be mindful of everyone's time and ending promptly on time. Um, any last questions before we wrap up? This was so great. Maybe for our next presentation. Actually, if you want to mention in the comments any other topics you'd like to hear about from Cliff, he leads such great workshops. And I love to see Charles and you know repeat folks who come just for Cliff and who he has as guest speakers. But if there's anything you want to hear about in the future, feel free to mention it in the chat or anything renovation design-wise. Maybe Cliff, our next one in the future, maybe it could be about kind of design um, trends that we see or kind of like what, what works, what doesn't in the real estate space. Yeah, that could be a neat one. Great use of the heart icon too, or emoji, Charles. <laughs> um, cool. All right. Well, I think, um, yeah, thank you all for joining. As Connie mentioned, we'll end on time and give you all, um, let you guys go. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But thanks for tuning in and have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye, everyone. Oh.
off when he did that. If it was on, he did. All right. Oh, that was so fun.